Typically, the towns found in the remains of Mithrin are a forgettable lot, the most interesting traits often relics of the ancient world, rather than anything new to boast about. Life in the remains revolves around basic needs and survival, rather than catering to the luxuries of culture or society. Tavaros, however, sought to be something different, something memorable. It succeeded all too well. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Post-apocalypse is typically the domain of science fiction or contemporary horror, and this is reflected in games. But mixing it with fantasy is a motif that's especially uncommon. As I mentioned at the end of the last video, the solution taken with Laughing Moon hitting a creative wall was to blow it up. The result of this is Wheelhouse, which stands in diametric opposition to the mechanically crunchy Laughing Moon. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Unlike its predecessor, Wheelhouse is much more printer-friendly at 95 pages, if a bit more minimalist. This does make it an easier read, but there's a few problems, namely in the way it presents information being a little scattershot, with more focus on the new setting than on the mechanics. That's not to say the latter doesn't exist, but it, the way it's organized is a bit jumpy. It'd be tempting to bring up the reused artwork, but the mix of artwork with photos always bugs me when it happens. Oh, and there's still no index. The name of the game is Streamlining, and character creation is no exception. For the purposes of this, we'll be making a Bandiar, a resurrected version of Joan Riwa, who goes by the alias of Joseph. The first step is the race, and while Joseph looks human, he's still a Bandiar. This grants him a plus one bonus to Fortitude, Magic, and Rook, a resilience of 25 and a defense of 10. Second, we spend our starting 12 modifier points. These can be spent on the four skill sets or the eight attributes, bearing in mind that all are capped at five. The spread for this will be one in general, two in melee, two in strength, one in agility, one in perception, two in fortitude, two in luck, and one in magic. This results in the following derived values. Melee attack four, ranged attack three, resilience 29, and 12 spell points. Finally, equipment. In this case, he'll be sticking with a two-handed sword, a godsteel pistol, which he keeps for emergencies, and medium armor, the latter making his defense rating 16. I realize that the creation process last time was a bit on the complicated side, but I can't help but feel this version took the pendulum and swung it a bit hard the other way. The fact that it ultimately depends on 12 points makes this feel like so many other narrativist indie RPGs I've seen since the days of Wushu Open. While I'm no stranger to simple cores, I wish there was something else besides that base. Some equivalent to feats, or the fighting moves from Laughing Moon, just some kind of crunch. The fortunate part about Wheelhouse is that it has a more defined core mechanic with a d20 based approach. Having it be based around that core set of attributes makes for a solid core narrativist mechanic. Owing to its post-apocalypse motif, the new method on resilience and misfortune is intended to demonstrate how things can go from bad to worse. Misfortune is your bad luck value that can accumulate primarily through natural one rolls. When this accumulated misfortune reaches a character's resilience, it resets the zero and the character gains a consequence. On paper, this is a perfectly fine approach, but I think it could stand to have some more examples of consequences. Barring that, a random consequence table would have done fine. Not helping matters is that damage also counts as misfortune, which explodes on a natural 20. I think this is a bit much in the way of double dipping. Bandu is still the extra effort mechanic but its use is both simplified and expanded. Players, GMs, and special characters start out with 2d10 Bandu points. The primary expenditure of these is to increase die results or damage on a one-for-one -one rate. In addition, it acts as an initiative score during combat. Lastly, leftover Bandu can be spent as experience, with five Bandu adding one point to a given attribute or skill, rolling again at the next session. Frankly speaking, Bandu suffers from overuse. In one resource, you have extra effort, turn order, action economy, and experience all in one. That is way too much to rely on one point, and in worse scenarios, can encourage playing more conservatively with them than is necessary. The core mechanic for casting spells is largely unchanged, though spell points are a little more forgiving this time, and obviously there isn't three skills that you need to deal with. This time, though, casting spells without spell points inflicts misfortune equal to the negative points spent, plus 1d4. Bandiar, being created by magic, have a set of spells already instilled in the source stone they all carry. They may also take magic through a process called rooking, which grants them extra spell points. Bone casters use a more chaotic type of magic, so named because of their enchanted six-sided dice. 
This nature of their magic means that there are no spell points or fire and forget. Instead, they choose one of the four effect types and roll 2d6. The result determines if they cast the spell, or if there's some extra effects while casting it, or if they don't cast it at all. The only real safety net is the Bandu Bender, a 2d6 roll made upon character creation whose results can be seen as a joker. If that number is rolled on a casting attempt, the bone caster can choose the effect manually. While the third part, Magical Talismans, is fairly standard, I do have to say I like how magic is used here. It's far more interesting than the skill-reliant setup that Laughing Moon had. In the seventh generation of video games, the misuse of Streamline made the word itself a bit dirty, since it was always perceived as shorthand for a lack of mechanical complexity. I would not go that far with Wheelhouse, but there is definitely some streamlining at play here, for better and for worse. That said, Wheelhouse does fall into the same trap that often happens with similar attempts to streamline mechanics. That being the importance of build. As I've mentioned in the past, the act of building the mechanical part of a character can be just as instrumental in connecting them to the player as the narrative part. In Wheelhouse, the mechanic effectively boils down to three core ideas. The d20 roll, Bandu, and Misfortune, with a foundation built around them that justifies that. Yes, spellcasters like Bandiar, Branded, and Bonecasters add extra mechanics, but those are only within a limited scope. There's also the elephant in the room regarding organization. Instead of having character creation or equipment be their own chapter, there's a fair bit of jumping around in the book. More than once an entry is interrupted in lieu of something else. Laughing Moon also had this problem, but I'd argue its bigger crunch somewhat justified it. Somewhat being the operative word here. That's not to say the game is without merit. It does establish its post-apocalyptic tone very well. The core mechanic is something far more focused here, and the use of magic has a stronger identity than in Laughing Moon. Even so, the highest grade I can give this game is playable. Creator Todd Van Hooser strikes me through both of these as someone who's more of a writer than he is a designer. I don't mean that as an insult, it's just my observation. Both Laughing Moon and Wheelhouse strike me as a collection of ideas first and foremost, and could stand a bit of writing the ship, as it were. I realize narrative is important, but it should not be at the expense of crunch and hand wave it as something up to the GM. The GM is under enough pressure as it is. As far as whether or not I'd run either game at my table, the answer is unlikely, though Wheelhouse has a slightly better chance. The main reason is that the former has crunch, but a lack of mechanical focus while the latter has a focused mechanic, but lacks narrative mechanics to justify its streamlined nature. If there's a lesson in all of this, it's that kit bashing is the beginning of a game, not the end. At least it's enjoyable to watch the replays. 